Roger DeGroote Sr. had just finished mowing his backyard in Upper Ringwood, a small neighborhood in the North Jersey Highlands. He went inside his house for a wrench to fix his weed whacker. When he came back out, his backyard was gone. In its place was a crater the size of a small swimming pool. Roger was lucky. If he would have been outside even seconds later, he would have fallen into the sinkhole. But stories like this one from July 2005 aren't isolated events in Ringwood and are becoming more frequent because of extreme weather fueled by climate change. Roger's home and many others in this North Jersey neighborhood are located on top of the former Ringwood mines. It's an underground labyrinth of mine shafts, some centuries old, that weren't always properly filled or sealed. Experts acknowledge that some of the oldest mines, which date back to the 1700s, may be unmapped and had their exact locations lost to history. The folks that live in this area aren't only in danger of being swallowed by the earth. Oh, if Mother Nature unleashes her wrath, they may be impacted by wildfires and flooding as well. This would be terrifying all on its own. But the former Ringwood Mines, where about 50 homes are located, is also a super fun site. Just one of these extreme weather events could re-release toxins into this community and its watershed. This is Hazard, a limited series about the impacts of climate change on Superfund sites here in New Jersey. I'm Jordan Gosporé, an investigative journalist from Texas. I spent many summers as a kid on my family's property in the Texas Hill Country. My Nana would fill up jugs with water from the creek for us to drink. I was curious if the water was contaminated. So for one middle school science project, I tested the water. My science teacher remarked that the creek water was cleaner than the water I drank in my hometown of Seguin, Texas. He encouraged me to keep drinking that creek water. More than a decade later, the area surrounding my family's property has become developed with McMansions and shopping centers. I wonder if that creek water is still as clean. I'm not the only one who has water on the brain. Driving to Ringwood, New Jersey. Okay, being in the passenger seat while my colleague is driving us to Ringwood, New Jersey, I saw numerous signs about keeping the area's water pure. The irony of these signs wasn't lost on me. See, for more than 50 years, Ringwood has been home to a toxic dump that's impacted the land and its groundwater. Well, the dump is specifically in Upper Ringwood, a community in the borough of Ringwood. Folks in Ringwood are proud of the fact that iron from their mines helped the American army during the Revolutionary War. And they told me about how George Washington visited the area. Ringwood Manor was originally built to house iron workers. The building later became the summer home to the wealthy Cooper Hewitt family. Today, its vast grounds are part of Ringwood State Park. A lot has changed here over the centuries. The mining stopped decades ago, and many people have come and gone. That is, except a sect of the Ramapo Muncie Lenape Nation called the Turtle Clan, who continue to live in Upper Ringwood. Their roots in the area stretch back to at least the Revolutionary War. Our people went back to the 1700s yeah. and way back, even, even further, mm -hmm. you know, because I remember all this area here. It used to be a college. They called it Green Engineering Camp. Oh, I remember that. Mm -hmm. And all the young teenagers, I used to hang out with them, and they were college students. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was nice. It was heaven. It was be Ringwood was beautiful. A lot of changes. Ringwood was beautiful. But now I go up and where I was born and raised, I look around, I'm like, man, what the heck happened? This is my mother's church. I met with Dennis DeFries Sr. and his neighbor Val Gunn at the Church of the Good Shepherd in Upper Ringwood. It's a small Episcopal church that's been a gathering place for the Ramapo for a long time. This church has been in existence since the 1700s. That's Val. She's about to turn 70 and is a proud grandma. When we met, she was wearing a hot pink t-shirt that read Grandma with the list of her grandchildren's names. It reminded me of my Nana. Life for Val's grandchildren is very different from when she was a child. Many of her childhood memories include exploring the surrounding woodlands. 
What stuck out to her was the water. We used to walk down the path and we'd get water. We, we would carry, carry water from the spring. And you talk about delicious, absolutely yeah, great yeah, water. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was the best in the world, yeah. I'm telling you. You're but right. we had to carry our water when we were kids growing up, but we did it. Like Val, Dennis grew up in Upper Ringwood. He remembers drinking the water flowing near his childhood home. I drank the water and I never got sick. All the time I drank it, me and my brothers. That is, until Ford Motor Company started dumping thousands of tons of paint sludge and other waste from the company's assembly plant in nearby Mawa, into and around the abandoned mines of Upper Ringwood. For years in the 1960s and 70s, Ford's plant in Mawa churned out hundreds of cars in a day. Ford was making the American dream come true for some people across the country and creating an American nightmare for the Ramapo people. Rangoon Red, Brittany Blue. These were some of the colors of paint that were sprayed on Ford's cars. The droplets that didn't stick would collect on the ground and in drains beneath the cars on the assembly line. And that excess paint was much of what was collected and dumped in Upper Ringwood. In 1984, the 500-acre Ringwood mine site was added to the Superfund list. Ford was responsible for paying to clean up the site, and they did it in record time. The EPA gave the site a clean bill of health when they delisted it in 1994. It took 11 years to clean up the site, and it'll take even more time to understand how it could have gone so wrong. Under normal circumstances, cleaning up a Superfund site is cause for celebration. But Ringwood Mines was never really cleaned up in the first place. Even after the site was delisted, residents continued to find paint sludge in their yards and scattered throughout Upper Ringwood. I met Jan Barry at the Ringwood Mines Superfund site. What caught my attention besides the fact that somebody had tied colored uh, ribbons along that whole area because they were creating a hiking trail. And I said to the EPA person who was there, you know, there's going to be kids walking down this hiking trail. No interest. We then went over on the far side of this community on the end of Conan Mine Road. There was a house. We go to the front yard. And they have paint sludge heaving out of the grass in front of the kids' play equipment. It was the same house that had the paint sludge in the backyard some years before. And at that point, frankly, I lost it. I said, you've got to be kidding me. We're back to the same place that you said you cleaned up. And at that point, I started writing memos to editors. Jan was one of the reporters with the Bergen Record that, along with the Ramapo, helped expose the large amounts of pollution that remained on the site in a series of articles called Toxic Legacy. We found internal documents where they say, well, the state probably won't take a close look at this. And then it was a housing organization nonprofit that built these newer houses over here, and they definitely won't take a close look at this gift to them. Aren't we so nice for giving them this nice contaminated land? And they had nasty things to say about these local people, using the terminology that only local area people would know to use. So Ford was already into the local prejudice against Ramapo Indians. And I guess that plays a huge part in what's going on here. The thing about paint sludge is that it looks like a plain old rock. Nothing to worry about. But break off a chunk, and it smells like fingernail polish remover. It's the acetone inside that's still potent. As you break it open, it's so fresh inside. The core never dried. So the chemical smell just erupts. Ah. Uh, I had a piece of this stuff on my desk in the record for a long time until I met some meeting in which somebody said, you know, there's a chemical thing coming off of this all the time. Stick it into a paper bag and then take a breath. Paint sludge contains a mixture of toxic chemicals like lead, arsenic, and chromium, among others. Levels of lead in paint sludge near homes have been found to be 100 times the levels the EPA considers acceptable. Wayne Mann, a Ramapo community leader who grew up in Upper Ringwood, says kids even played with the paint sludge, not knowing what it was. 
He remembers one of the times officials came by Upper Ringwood to inspect the site before it was put back on the Superfund list. This is what they saw. The one yard where they they came, a kid was sitting, banging on something, playing with his trucks. Well, what he was banging on was a giant piece of sludge, lead. Another yard, kids were out swinging on a swing set. All around that yard and swing set was all protruding through the ground, chunks of lead. It's all forwards. Well, that was supposed to be all cleaned up. Many of Upper Ringwood's residents say contamination from the paint sludge has made them sick. There are cases of skin rashes, severe headaches, bleeding from the eyes, nose, and throat, and various cancers. So many people have cancer, Val says, that locals call Van Dunk Lane Cancer Row. It earned the grim nickname because each house on the street has been impacted by cancer in one way, shape, or form. When Val's nephew, Colin, died from a rare form of cancer in 2001, that's when locals really started to notice how widespread the health issues were in Upper Ringwood. My nephew, my brother's son, developed, uh, it was called Ewing sarcoma when he was 10. And he developed that. And that's how everything started. He died a year later. He lived for one year from the time that he, he developed it. And then after that, it was like everybody started getting cancer. Yeah. Despite this, no one has been able to find a direct link between the paint sludge and these reported diseases. In 2006, the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services and the Federal Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry released a report on the health concerns related to the Superfund site. The agencies found that from 1979 through 2002, overall cancer incidence was not elevated in the area or in Ringwood Borough as a whole, compared to New Jersey. Shortly before the report was released, the Ringwood Mines was put back on the Superfund list, a first for the EPA. While every Superfund site needs to get cleaned up quickly, Ringwood Mines, if I had to make a priorities list, would be near the top. I'm not picking favorites or anything, but there's just so many different ways severe weather caused by climate change can still impact this Superfund site and wreak havoc on the residents of Upper Ringwood. To make things easier on all of us, I'm going to break down each of the potential climate impacts as succinctly as I can. More prevalent and intense forest fires means dangerous toxins could be released in the air. Dr. Judith Zelikoff, an NYU researcher, led a study in 2021 that found much higher rates of asthma and bronchitis among the Ramapo who used to or currently live near the mines. Wildfires and drought will only make these health problems worse. Not only do you have PCBs generated, you're going to have lots of metals. You're going to have uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon carcinogens. So you're going to have, um, if anyone treated their couches or their furniture, you know, with these treatments. So they're all going to be in the air. Judith mentioned PCBs. That's a group of human-made chemicals that were banned in the U.S. in the late 1970s. Even though the production of PCBs is banned, these chemicals are still present in our air, water, and soil. Climate change is making rainstorms more intense and frequent. When that heavy rainfall comes down, the water may rush through the old mines, fault lines, and cracks in the rock. If this happens, the water could flush contaminated groundwater into nearby streams and rivers. Greenwood sits on what's called um, fractured bedrock. And um, no one can tell you where the contaminated water is going to go. It's impossible. Ford says they know. It, it, they just can't know. That's Fenka Tall. She became the borough's first woman mayor in 2005 and was in office when Ringwood Mines was put back on the Superfund list. If something should occur, you know, an event with climate change, flooding, whatever, it could flush this contamination through the factors. Now, if Upper Ringwood was not on top of mines, there'd be less concern about these fractures in the ground. But Alec Gates, a geologist with Rutgers Newark who spent much of his career working in the Ringwood area, says the mining has pretty much stripped away the ground's natural filtration system, potentially exposing people to contaminated water. 
So if you have bad things on the surface, as long as you have that thick black layer there, all anything that comes through it will tend to filter it out. If you don't have it there, like you do around a mine area, it'll just go straight into the groundwater system without any filtering. People have been drinking the water in Upper Ringwood for a very long time, way before Ford started dumping chemicals there. But the pollution has gotten so bad that no one drinks it anymore, and they may never drink it again. Alex says there's no way all of the groundwater in the area can be treated. You can't get the sludge all out. It's in the cracks. How are you going to do that? So you would have to like excavate the whole area. And that's tough rock. That's not going to be easy to excavate. And then what are you, how are you going to clean it out? Heavy rainfall may quickly flow through the Superfund site's fractured bedrock, spreading already polluted groundwater in ways that geologists and engineers don't fully understand. That puts nearby bodies of water at risk, including the Wanaki Reservoir, which supplies drinking water to more than 3 million people across North Jersey when demand for water is at its peak. I went to the North Jersey District Water Supply Commission treatment plant in Wanakee, just south of Ringwood, to see the reservoir for myself. While I was there, I talked with the commission's executive director, Tim Eustace, about the risks the Ringwood Mine Superfund site poses to the reservoir. The mine is two and a half miles from here. So I just want to make sure if anything happens that I can address it a mile away, that it never reaches this body of water. Increasingly heavy rains on the Ringwood mine site could spread contamination downhill, where the reservoir sits. My concern was the fault lines because there's a fault line under the reservoir and there's a fault line along the mountain range where the mines are. The, and the geologists say the fault lines do not run the way that I should have concerns. I think the fault lines run east-west and they'd have to be north-south for it to create runoff coming down here. So I'm somewhat quelled by that geology report. But, you know, Earth doesn't always do what we think it's going to do. So I'm almost comfortable with that report. Almost comfortable. There's one pesky contaminant that keeps Tim up at night. That's 1,4-dioxane, a colorless solvent used by industries to dissolve oily or greasy substances. 1,4-dioxane was first found in groundwater at the site in the spring of 2015. But residents weren't told until the record broke the news nearly a year later. In a public meeting after the findings were made available to everyone, EPA officials said they regretted not announcing them sooner. The chemical has since been found in Sally's Pond, a small water body in Ringwood State Park just downhill of the mines. The water in Sally's Pond eventually flows into the Wanaki Reservoir, but so far, the EPA says none of the chemical has been detected downstream of the pond since testing began in 2016. Tim says the EPA told him there is very little chance of the Wanaki Reservoir being contaminated. I want no chance of this happening. So it's my overabundance of caution, and 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 the commissioners here agree with me about that, that we want to be ahead of anything that happens. But just to be on the safe side, Tim says the reservoir is routinely tested for 1,4-dioxane and other hazardous chemicals. Okay, on the left here is our lab. Tim took me on a tour of the commission's big treatment plant to show me where the testing happens. This is, you can just peek in and see, this is the control room for... It was loud and smelled like a high school gym. Even though the EPA now considers 1,4-dioxane to be a likely human carcinogen, It's not currently regulated by the federal government. The scary part is, once 1,4-dioxane is in water, it's likely to stay there and doesn't break down. At the Ringwood Mine Superfund site, there's also the increased risk of more frequent sinkholes, like what Roger DeGroote Sr. experienced in 2005. Venka remembers getting a phone call one night from Vivian Milligan, a former Ramapo leader, There's a gigantic hole in Roger's yard. I said, what, is it the septic? Oh no, this is something very different. As it turned out, it was a mine hole that had supposedly been closed in the 1800s that opened up because of water. If the Ringwood mine site isn't cleaned up soon, Alex says a heavy and more frequent rainfall caused by climate change may increase the risk of sinkholes in the area. Obviously, if you do any 
construction on these mines, they're extremely dangerous because you can open things up, the construction equipment can fall in, or you can build something on top of a place that you really shouldn't. The climate concerns Alec, Vinka, and Tim have for Upper Ringwood aren't shared by Ringwood Borough Manager Scott Heck. Let's see, going through our list here, on wildfires, Scott says... With the exception of um, a fire that we had, I think a year or two ago, that was a result of the power lines on the that was in and around the, uh, uh, the Superfund site, we really have not seen any. Mm-hmm. We have had a few fires in Upper Ringwood also, uh, relative to home fires, um, but our response is, is relatively quick to all of those situations. Um, so it's it's not a, a big concern for us um, because we, we, we do watch that and we haven't had many at all. Flooding and groundwater contamination aren't going to be an issue, Scott says, because part of the site's cleanup plan, which involves capping the contaminated area, addresses these concerns. The capping uh, calls for a pullback of the waste from the edges and consolidating it away from the brook so that it minimizes and and reduces any chance of that getting into into the water stream. And sinkhole shrinkholes. Scott says there's only one area in and around the Superfund site that's susceptible to this problem. To help prevent the gates of hell from opening up again, The borough's engineers did a lot of extensive research to ensure that residents stay safe. So we had uh, uh, geo-technical individuals come in and do all kinds of extensive studies. We did uh, borings down to bedrock throughout the entire area. The one area where there was a subsidence in the road, we filled in, we remediated, um, and we have uh, conducted a study throughout the entire area. Um, to identify using mining maps and, the, and, and drilling and borings to determine where there might be voids. And the engineers determined that it is safe and we have, we have addressed any areas of concern. Scott isn't alone here. The New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection told me that the Ringwood area has a low level of sinkhole risk compared to the rest of the state. And the EPA says the new cleanup plan has been designed to protect against potential sinking or caving. The decades-long saga between the Ramapo and Ford is a classic David and Goliath story. This captured the attention of HBO. They spent years chronicling the class action lawsuit filed by the Ramapo against Ford for dumping toxic chemicals on their land. The documentary is called Man v. Ford, named after Wayne Mann, who became a leader in the fight to hold Ford responsible for the pollution. In the filming of the documentary, 55 people died in the five years that was being filmed. So there's not as many people there that it used to be that even knows the woods anymore. You know what I mean? Because it's like, it's probably out there, but even more than just a sludge, it's what's in the mines. But you're going to never fully investigate because they know. They know what's down there or they surmise what's down there. They don't, it's a can of worms. As I was told at one meeting, that doesn't want to be opened. Wayne and I met up at Ringwood State Park to talk about his past experiences as a community leader, what he's learned, and what he plans to do next. I stood my ground, and I stood the ground for the people that I loved. And I stood ground for people that I'll never meet that may even dislike me because maybe they'll say, oh, he started trouble. But I started trouble because you're drinking the water. Years after Wayne and other members of the Ramapo filed suit, Ford, their contractors, and the borough of Ringwood settled with them for $11 million. Many families only received about $8,000 each. Some of the Ramapo maintain many of their traditions. They hunt deer and fish in the nearby streams for food. They grow vegetables in their yards. Living off this land before it was known to be a Superfund site may have exposed them to toxins and harmed their health. And while Val still lives in Upper Ringwood, Dennis and many others have left their ancestral land for fear they die from the contaminants. Now there's only a few people left to pass down the Ramapo traditions. Wayne says Upper Ringwood, where the mines are, is the heart of Ringwood. It still beats, just not as fast anymore. You took care of all the treasures surrounding the heart. You let the heart be poisoned. Because why? because we lived there, you know, but we, we absorbed it, we accepted it, we stayed, we fought, we didn't want to go anywhere. 
The fear is that one day soon, the only living reminders of the Ramapo will be the recreational spaces named by European colonists, the Ramapo Mountains and the Ramapo River. And despite the battle with toxins and climate change and lawsuits with companies, the bigger fear in this region is that people will forget the people these places are named after. Ramapo clan mother Vivian Milligan was Upper Ringwood's unofficial historian. Vivian spoke with the Ringwood Public Library's Oral History Project. Here she is talking about the origins of the last name Van Donk. Supposedly it's a Dutch name because mm-hmm. a lot of Dutch settlers did come right. up the Hudson mm-hmm. far and wide mm-hmm. along with the Native Americans and they settled you know, along the Hudson. Van Donk Lane, AKA Cancer Row, is named after these folks. Vivian lived in the area her entire life and spent years trying to get forward to clean up the mines. In 2016, she got down on her knees at a public meeting with an EPA official and begged them to remove the waste instead of capping it. Vivian died last August before she could see Ringwood Mines cleaned up. But her legacy lives on. To many Ramapo, their concerns have fallen on deaf ears. Their story is one that's historically been told by people who aren't Ramapo. Racist myths about the community have caused them to be demonized. Residents told us stories of racism they've been subjected to. And there's a belief that Ford picked their homes to dump on as a form of discrimination. In 1980, the Ramapo were recognized as a tribe by the state of New Jersey. But despite numerous efforts, the tribe still isn't recognized by the U.S. government. The Ramapo don't have time to wait around for the federal government to change their mind. Instead, some members are reclaiming the traditions Ford and the borough of Ringwood stole. I visited the Muncie Three Sisters Medicinal Farm in Andover Township, about an hour away from Ringwood. It was a day too hot for my black cardigan, and the ground was too muddy for my black flats. Just goes to show that it's been a long time since I was on a farm. I was there to meet Vincent Mann, chief of the Ramapo's turtle clan and co-founder of the farm. Chief Mann co-created the farm in 2019 to address food insecurity in Upper Ringwood. It's not just about providing food to our community who shouldn't be growing vegetables where they are in the Superfund site. but it's also about food sovereignty. So, you know, we grew up in a pretty crappy society, but in the same breath, you know, we're still here. And, you know, while we held on to a lot, you know, um, including our identity, um, people are now beginning to wake up to that fact, even more so, right? But Chief Mann's ultimate goal is to have the residents of Upper Ringwood relocated, permanently, to a new community that would be built on nearby county parkland. It's an idea that has come up in public meetings in the past, but Chief Mann is now ready to really start pushing it. Just last month, Chief Mann met with EPA and state officials, plus Congressman Frank Pallone and Josh Gottheimer, to make his latest pitch. This was laid out in a PowerPoint presentation that was shared with NJ Spotlight News afterwards. In the PowerPoint, Chief Mann asked for 300 residents, currently living in 50 homes, to be moved into 100 new homes on Tranquility Ridge. That land's not far from the existing neighborhood in Upper Ringwood. The cost? At least $50 million. This isn't unheard of. The Superfund law allows the EPA to pay for temporary or permanent relocation if it's deemed necessary to protect public health. But this has only happened 33 times, and only 11 of those relocations were permanent. One of those was the Grand Street Mercury site in Hoboken, where free-flowing mercury was found dripping between the floors of an old industrial building. Literally liquid mercury was found when they were doing reconstruction, was found in the walls, it was dripping out of the ceilings, it was in closets, falling out to people. Um, So uh, the county health department actually made the decision there 
literally overnight, the people had to move out of the building. Right now, the EPA is not considering relocation as an option in Ringwood. Walter Mugden, the Deputy Regional Administrator for EPA Region 2, says relocation is only considered when all other cleanup options have been exhausted. Relocation is considered an extraordinary remedy and one that is considered to be appropriate when there's an immediate threat to residents that can't be addressed through other less intrusive means. Still, EPA did commit at the meeting to take another look at the relocation option at Chief Mann's request. It doesn't help that without federal recognition, the Ramapo don't have the same influence over the Superfund process that another tribe might. Chief Mann says after the decades of dumping and the botched cleanup, the Ramapo of Upper Ringwood deserve the chance to start over with a clean slate. It's not just because we want a shiny new house. And it isn't because relocating our community now is going to stop, you know, the health ailments, the cancers, and the deaths right now. But we don't think about just tomorrow. We think about the next seven generations. We need to bring our community back together. We have, you know, hundreds of people who moved away from there thinking that they were going to protect themselves, except for the fact that because their parents were exposed to these toxic chemicals, they too, no matter how far away they move, they can move all the way to the moon and they're still gonna have those health ailments. But Val, who I met up with at the Church of the Good Shepherd in Ringwood, doesn't wanna leave. Well, I'm not gonna lie to you. I love it here. Uh, You know, I'm not gonna say, oh yeah, you know. I, I absolutely love it here. It's just things have to be done right. Things have to be done better. Wayne Mann says there are people like Val and his sister who want to stay because of their familial connection with the land. For my sister, she already told me. When she goes, she's going like her parents did, you know, and it's home. It's the only home that they know. I can't answer that for the rest of the community because that's Vincent's job. He speaks for them. I speak for the environment. And Angel Stefancic, a 22-year-old who has spent her entire life in Upper Ringwood and is now raising a family there. She thinks that leaving would be the opposite of the goal of decolonization. To her, land back means staying on the land they're currently on. You're giving them what they want. They want us to uproot and just go. That's their whole sole purpose, because once they get their hands on our land, guess what? It's free game. So what happens now for the Ramapo? It's clear that Chief Mann faces a tough road ahead in convincing both the government and his own community in relocating the residents of Upper Ringwood. And that work is just beginning. But back on the farm, he remains optimistic that the Turtle Clan's best days lie ahead. Surrounded by acres of sprouting crops and a pair of playful dogs, Chief Mann says he finds hope and inspiration in what's already been accomplished and that fuels a determination to move ahead. You know, my grandfather always told me that the sun's always shining somewhere, right? Doesn't matter if it's night or day, doesn't matter right now, it always is shining, right? And I just thought when I was younger that that meant that the sun was always shining, right? Which was a metaphoric thing, but I didn't really understand that, you know? But I do, right? The sun is literally shining all the time. The EPA reached a $21 million settlement with Ford in 2019 to cap the site. This money would also help pay to remove contaminated soil from around the opening of one of the mine's pits. This is a controversial move because it means tons of the polluted soil will still remain on site under an asphalt barrier and across the street from many of the Ramapo's homes. Ford's not the only one on the hook for the cleanup. The borough of Ringwood owned the land the company dumped on. And because of that, the EPA has determined the local government is partly responsible for the mess. Scott says over the years, the borough has appealed the EPA's decision that makes them partially liable for the site's pollution. He says there have even been points where the boroughs disagreed with Ford. But there was no way around the borough paying something to clean up the site. At some point, you have to determine, 
listen, the EPA has said we're a responsible party and there's a percentage that has been agreed upon that, that we're going to be compensating uh, the Ford Motor Company because there was also um, many, many years ago dumping there, both acknowledged or, or known about by the borough of Ringwood, as well as the state of New Jersey. So um, are we a responsible party? We accept that, that we are only because A, we own the property and there was some knowledge back then, um, theoretically. Um, I still don't understand why when the state is in the exact same party, why they're not a responsible party. The EPA had originally planned to have the borough and Ford pay more than $32 million to remove the contamination from just one part of the site. But that changed when Ford and the borough pitched a new plan to only remove some of the pollution and put a protective cap over the rest. This plan allows the borough to build a new, larger recycling center on top of the capped soil and across the street from their current recycling center. The move lowered the cleanup cost to a little over $5 million and had a mixed reaction from Ringwood residents. Those who wanted the pollution removed were outraged. Others, who worried a more expensive cleanup would raise their property taxes, supported the construction of a new recycling center. The EPA went along with the new plan because, they said, it still protects public health. And because, of course, they don't have any control over how a town wants to use their land. This is despite the fact that the agency originally wanted to get rid of the toxic soil. Scott says capping the site was in the best interests of all involved. I mean, uh, think about it. it. To excavate all this material out, the plan was for 13,250 truck trips um, out of the neighborhood. What would that do to the folks that are living in and around there? I mean, 13,250 truck trips, it would have significantly increased the amount of time that this cleanup would take. It would significantly impact their day-to-day -day lives for a long time. What risks are associated with moving that type of material? What risks are associated to the children in the neighborhood? And what risks are associated with digging it out for that length of time and impacting a stream while, it's, while, you're, while you're digging out? Most of the cleanup is complete, Scott says. I think that the excavation is uh, substantially complete. Um, and I don't know exactly the, the ultimate uh, percentage, but uh, I think that uh, you'll see that in the next coming months, that'll be uh, wrapped up uh, significantly. Ford declined to answer specific questions that we sent them. Instead, a company spokesperson sent us this. <clears throat> Ford Motor Company takes its environmental responsibility seriously and has shown, through its actions, a commitment to addressing the issues in Upper Ringwood that are related to Ford. Ford continues to work cooperatively with the Borough of Ringwood, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, NJDEP. Contractor activities to remedy the three soil areas requiring remediation started in late fall of 2021. What could be the final cleanup at Ringwood Mines began earlier this year. Scott's hopeful this will be the last time Ringwood Mines will be on the Superfund list because the cleanup area has been expanded. I'm hoping that they have learned from their errors of the past that this is the last remediation. Although I have to tell you, from my perspective, watching what went on and they did really go above and beyond to ensure that there's not a third cleanup. So. Um, so they maybe they have uh, corrected some of those issues of the past, and I think we're going to get a, a good cleanup, and the residents are going to be better off for it. Hazard is a space not just for learning about Superfund sites, but for engaging our communities in conversation around the cleanup of these toxic places. Do you have questions about Superfund sites in New Jersey? Do you live near one? If so, I want to hear from you. Send me a tweet using hashtag HazardNJ or leave me a voice memo at hazard at myNJPBS.org. We may play your comments in a future episode. Hazard NJ is an NJ Spotlight News production. The show is written, edited, and hosted by me, Jordan Gosporé. Jamie Kraft is the executive producer with NJ Spotlight News. Our executive in charge of production is Joe Lee. Michael Saul Warren is our associate producer. Chris Panza is our production assistant. Chloe Matisi is our production manager. Additional research by Meryl Moshu. Our sound designer and engineer is Mark Bush. 
Music for Hazard and Jay was composed by Nick Pennington. Artwork by Matthew Fleming. Support for Hazard and Jay is provided by Peril and Promise, a public media reporting initiative covering the human stories of climate change and its solutions, with major funding provided by Dr. P. Roy Vagelos and Diana T. Vagelos. You can learn more at pbs.org forward slash peril and promise. <laughs>